Gordy has just fallen off a ladder, um, an impossibly tall ladder. Gordy was plummeting through space, which, much to his relief, proved to be less harrowing than he might have expected. In fact, he'd been more afraid while still clinging to the runs. Now that he was airborne, there were other sensations to compete for his attention. The intense cold, the rushing wind, and the view of the sunset he was uniquely afforded. Then he was crashing through a canopy of trees, and that part was extremely painful. Once, as a boy, he'd fallen from a birch limb and landed on top of banks, both of them sustaining minor injuries. This was similar to that experience, only far worse. Among other places, he was battered in the neck, groin, hips, ribs, spine, one knee, and also the other knee. <laughs> Finally, after his body had been thoroughly pulverized, he had the good fortune to snag on a branch, landing on his stomach with his limbs dangling over the sides. The light was much dimmer here, now that he had departed from the stratosphere. To his right, far below, he caught a glimpse of a fast-moving river, the Columbia, he assumed. Gordon didn't recognize the shape, making him think he was miles from home. In the gloaming, the current rippled like an enormous snake. All around him, leaves rustled and boughs groaned. And then there was a snap and he was falling again. Only this time, he landed on his head. After a moment, the branch that had been supporting him also came down, and Gordy was plunged into darkness. He woke some time later with a pain like a gong. What is it? Somebody was yelling. Is we under attack? Coaxing one eye open, Gordy observed the glow of a campfire. Then he was being hauled to his feet, urgent hands poking and prodding him. Who are you? The second voice demanded to know. Where are you coming from? There were two men, one of them fat, the other one thin, both of them dressed in rags. After they leaned him up against a tree, they scurried back, standing on either side of the campfire, such that their faces were only partially illuminated. You a moon man? asked the fat one, jabbing a finger at him. Or an Irishman? accused the other. <laughs> when Gordy attempted to speak, he found the pain in his skull to be too overwhelming. Standing with his hands on his thighs, he raised a finger, requesting a moment. If you ain't no moon man, then who's the President of the United States? The first one persisted. That's right! We're the President of Ireland! <laughs> In an audible whisper, the fat man asked, Names, what is it with you and the Irish? I told you, Carmichael. I killed an Irishman in Murfreesboro. Only he wouldn't die. I tried arsenic. I tried castor beans. I even tried choking him. I swear, the whole time I had my hands around his neck, he was singing a dirge. Went on so long, I thought it was the resurrection. Gordy had already pegged the vagabonds as confederates, but the mention of Murfreesboro cemented his guess. In his experience, their type was quick to violence. That they hadn't harmed him yet meant they were fearful. That they were fearful meant they lacked scruples. Gordy remained hunched over while simultaneously trying to compose his thoughts. Just before he passed, Nance continued, he swore he'd take revenge. Five brothers he claimed he had, twice as many cousins. He swore they'd hunt me down no matter where I'd hide. So if a person's going to be jumping out of trees at other people, I'd like to know they ain't Irish. Grant, Gordy said as soon as he was able, the President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant. Making a sour face, the one called Carmichael spat on the ground. For now, he is. <laughs> For the look of things, their campsite was only temporary. No shelter had been erected, nor had any laundry been hung out to dry. Even their campfire suggested impermanence, the logs chiefly consisting of green wood. Slumped in the shadows was a young boy. Even in the half-light, it was plain to see that his lip had been split and his eye was bruised. Someone bigger and stronger had recently rendered beating. It could have been either man. It could have been both. For what good reason was you up that tree? asked Nance. Just keep a lookout, Gordy explained. Look out for what? When he refused to answer, the two men exchanged a glance. My goodness, Carmichael said, squatting and shaking his head like he just remembered something amusing. We ain't even introduced ourselves. You can call me Carmichael. This one here's names. Sorry about gravity, but when people start falling out of trees at other people, there's reason to be skittish. No hard feelings? Gingerly testing his shoulder, Gordy conveyed indifference. That's nice. We ain't looking for trouble. We're traveling north. You ever heard of Francis Myers, richest man in all of Oregon? He's hiring English-speaking trappers, me and Nance, his expert outdoors. Experts at killing people, too, Nance added. <laughs> or was, Carmichael agreed, during the war. I'd say we were responsible for at least a dozen deaths. So what'd you say, Nance? Union or rebel? 
guess it don't matter which. There's that boy who lost a hand, he died in his sleep. Then the boy with no hands, always thirsty, but couldn't hold the cup. <laughs> Nan's completely the thought. Then there was them boys from Tennessee, neighbors, they said, from the same holler. One died with a pillow to the face, the other from gangrene. Not that it matters. Now, it's all behind us. What matters is the present, or wouldn't you agree? Who's he? Gordy asked. Carmichael dismissively waved his hand at the boy. He's nothing, he said. Less than nothing. When we get to the logging camp, we'll trade him for Shaw. Now, what was it he was looking for? At the mention of the logging camp, the hair stood up on the back of Gordy's neck. He'd never been there before, but he was aware of it. A shanty town on the far side of the Cascades, owing its existence to Myers and Co. Maybe not so long ago, a logger had gotten drunk and wandered down from the timber line. Maybe an Indian had come up from the coast reservation. And a missionary, too, because you couldn't hold a porn without the Holy Ghost. These men would have required food and entertainment. Want begat labor, labor begat industry. And soon, the logging camp was born. It was a haven for lost souls. Fathers and husbands, the missing and the presumed dead. Those who had a weakness for gambling or drink, or those with no weakness at all. Nothing to go with their intractable hearts. Deep in the woods, where the continent still provided some measure of privacy, a man could ignore his past. He could live outside of history, where he's so inclined, indulging in every sort of delight, or just one. Could die a thousand deaths, or just one. The trees made for good company, neither inclined to gossip, nor did they approach. By the light of the campfire, Gordy regarded the boy. He had fine features, high cheekbones and lips in the shape of a heart. Still, he must have had iron at his core to endure such a beating. Somebody at the logging camp would pay a hefty price for him, presuming he made it that far. Look out for what? Carmichael 